Well, welcome to the Centro um, Conversations. Um, I think this is about the fourth or fifth in the series um, on, you know, just rethinking collective bargaining and organizational rights. And more importantly, today, it is also a tribute. Um, you know, this particular seminar is a of domestic workers who departed from us, sadly, on the 16th of January this year. Mm. And um, she leaves a great legacy as a global leader in the sector. She really elevated the voice of the voiceless across the world, not only in South Africa, but across the world. So we salute Myrtle today in this, um, at this event. And I would like to just read a poem by Tim. Workers Federation. I say over and over the same things. Shoo. Domestic workers are people. How do you not see us? You think we don't have husbands, sons, daughters? You think our parents don't want us home for Christmas? You think we do this dirty work because we have nothing better to do? Shoo, shame. We take your children to the park. Our children like the park. They need sunshine too. But we are not with our children. We are in your house. So you can go to work, to the beach, fly around the world and come home to polished floors, pressed clothes, hot food, and forks that shine. But we don't have anything else to live for. Shoo. We have friends to visit, books to read. Yes, we read. Domestic workers want time for their own lives. We are not washing machines or cooking machines. We are people with hopes and hard questions. People who want a few nice things. You say we're part of the family. Then maybe you come clean up my house next Tuesday so I can sit somewhere with a coffee. Maybe get my hair done. I like the beach. I like to see the little fish scoot. Feel the waves splash my feet. Shoo. You think I don't get sick of these heavy shoes. And I must admit, Myrtle never got sick of those heavy shoes that she wore as she traveled to close to 50 countries promoting social justice for domestic workers. And we have pledged to continue the work. So I'd like to also just acknowledge Jennifer Fish, um, who is currently busy doing Myrtle's biography. And we wish you all the best and all the strength with that too. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the, the speaker for today, Adal Blackett, Professor of Law at McGill University. She also is the Canada Research Chair in Transnational Labour Law and Development. And just not mentioning all the other accolades, Adal is also an associate of Centro. And the choice for this webinar, I met Adal, I think it was 2010, when she was an ILO expert 
in the making of Convention 189. And we spent time just chatting over things with Myrtle. That was a very, very momentous occasion in the history of organizing domestic work, the making of Convention 189. So from a global perspective, Adal, we welcome Adal um, to this event. And at a local level, Kelly Bochili Kunu is a researcher at the Socioeconomic Rights Institute. Her master's, was, her master's research was based on domestic workers' engagement with everyday life their social networks, and the building of their political subjectivities. And she's worked intensely in the campaign and also the legal case, the landmark case, where the High Court ruled that exclusion of domestic workers in South Africa, exclusion from the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act was unlawful. So. And I think, you know, having both uh, speakers, uh, the speaker and respondent, one at the global level and one at the local level is exactly how Myrtle operated in this world. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Adele. Thank you so much, dear Fairus, uh, for that uh, beautiful poem uh, and contextualization. Uh, I have started to share my screen. Uh, is it visible for you? Okay. Yes, it is. Fabulous. So I'll start the slideshow and uh, start the presentation. And you'll see this is... Uh, uh, well, you'll see. Uh, so it's an eno enormous honor uh, to have been asked to offer a tribute uh, to the late Myrtle Whitboy. Um, and let me just start by saying how humbling it is uh, for me uh, to speak to colleagues assembled around this virtual room, many of you from Centro in South Africa, several of you very close comrades and friends and fellow travelers with Myrtle. Uh, and you've already uh, uh, conveyed uh, the depth of the commitment and conviction uh, that uh, has uh, characterized um, the decades, the lifetime of uh, commitment uh, to uh, the cause that Myrtle espoused. So your invitation to me, I take as an opportunity, um, an all too rare opportunity in academic life, uh, to share our love uh, for Myrtle, for what she represents, uh, for the global movement, for the commitment to social justice, for the commitment to decent work for domestic workers. So please accept my thanks, uh, Fairuz, uh, members of Centro, uh, Jennifer Fish, for all of the accompaniment uh, throughout a lifetime of activism and in this uh, moment of preparing uh, a biography in her honor. Thank you for the kind invitation to say a few words in Myrtle's honor. Um, and uh, thank you in advance to Kelly Bogile, who knew, knew her comments. Uh, in relation to this presentation. So Myrtle Whitbue was the mother of the movement for domestic workers' rights. And tribute after tribute that has come forward since her passing on the 16th of January, 2023, the day that we celebrated another 
of uh, our world heroes, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. emphasizes the brilliant leadership, the absolute commitment to the cause and the remarkable love and care that she showed for the many domestic workers and allies that she met over the years in the movement. The message throughout her life's work has been to keep the focus on domestic workers' emancipation. Or in words that have become a rallying call, nothing for us, nothing about us, without us. Myrtle Whitbury embodied that ethic of ensuring that domestic workers are workers, that domestic workers move from the margins of our imagination of what work looks like to the center of our thinking on labor law and labor policy making, not by benevolent others, not by the guardians of our field, but by clearing space so that domestic workers themselves can take their rightful place at the center of our understanding of our field. So I saw this in action in Myrtle's words insistently and particularly poignantly for me at a UN Women's Forum in fall 2011, soon after convention number 189 had been adopted, Myrtle insisted that convention 189 belonged to domestic workers, that domestic workers had prepared the path for it to be adopted, had fought for it, had given it energy and meaning, had insisted that it remained strong and reflective of domestic workers' lived experience of disenfranchisement and claims for meaningful inclusion. This focus is such a crucial corrective for so much of how we engage with our field of labor law. It should shape how we move forward on the relationship between the freedom of association and collective bargaining rights and equality. So first, I met Myrtle in Geneva when, as Farouz mentioned, convention number 189 was being negotiated um, in 2010. So the first of two years of uh, International Labor Conference uh, committee meetings uh, on the adoption of Convention 189. And uh, I hardly need to say, but she was absolutely formidable. A presence and a force whose clarity of insight carried so much of the negotiation over what would become convention number 111. Now, it's not that she was one of the uh, representatives of any of the three uh, designated uh, constituents of the ILO. Uh, we know uh, how ILO uh, tripartism uh, created uh, both the opportunity to have the discussion, but also for the majority of domestic workers meant that they were observers outside of the formal structure. But for Convention 111, domestic workers were exceptionally present. And Myrtle Whitbury, uh, wearing two hats, and the, the International Domestic Workers at the time network, which became the Federation. And of course, Sid Sao's uh, uh, representative uh, was 
able and present and claiming uh, that leadership space, uh, but her capacity uh, to embody a movement uh, in the most inclusive ways ensured uh, that the focus always remained on domestic workers. And of course, the presence did not just happen. Her story of advocating for domestic workers' rights has a much longer history. What I want to stress is the link that she made between her anti-apartheid activism and domestic workers' activism. There were deep continuities between the two movements, and Myrtle understood domestic workers' activism within the framework of a freedom struggle and pursued it with the same degree of conviction and care. For the ILO, the relationship between its own standard setting and uh, engagement with uh, the ending of political apartheid uh, was also part of the narrative and the continuity, and indeed the reason why the ILO was called uh, to start engaging with domestic work in the early 1990s when South Africa came to it and said, we need to look very carefully at whether domestic work, which will continue to be done overwhelmingly by Black women in South Africa at the end of apartheid, could that work be transformed? Could it become, in the ILO's later language, decent work uh, through what in South Africa became understood as a notion of transformative constitutionalism and which certainly Darcy Dutoit and many others around this virtual table have uh, championed in their own uh, crucial writing on this theme. But the key is there was a huge challenge uh, to addressing the, the relationship between societal transformation and deepened understandings of the nature of the work uh, that so characterized the relationship of subordination uh, in a deeply inequitable context. The themes permeated Myrtle's work. They permeated her activism and her message was invariably laden with strong critique, but also with optimism about the power of change. At the December 2010 UN Forum on Minority Issues, conveyed by the uh, uh, convened rather by the formidable Gay McDougall, Myrtle offered a moving reminder of the challenge and the urgency. And her handwritten speaking notes have actually been preserved on the forum's website. Uh, and I went back to them in preparing uh, for this talk, but I have to say the memory of her speech and how it felt to hear her speak is indelibly etched on my own consciousness. She opened with the following words, domestic work is rooted in the global history of slavery, yet domestic work is work like any other work. She spoke from the heart and she spoke of what freedom looks like for domestic workers, 
a living wage, social security benefits, respect, acknowledgement of the importance of domestic work to society. Domestic work is market enabling work. Um, and of course, collective action. And she ended with the following words. We want our pride, our dignity, our respect back as workers, mainly women. We want to walk tall, to be proud as workers, workers that belong, migrants, urban, rural. We are all here to stay. When she ended her most moving remarks, the conference chair, Professor G Gita Sen, after pausing for a moment to take in uh, just the power of those words, thanked her for speaking from the heart. Myrtle's insights inspire rethinkings in our field of labor law. And as I thought back to my own 2010 article on emancipation in the idea of labor law, I thought of how much Myrtle's life uh, and contributions to thinking and acting on social justice reflected uh, the narrative of change in our field that flowed through that work. And perhaps there is no coincidence that it was 2010, uh, the year that I met Myrtle, that I also wrote this piece. The starting points were to rethink the narrative of labor law. And they embody, I believe, the kind of transnational challenge to international labor law that the movement of domestic workers led by Myrtle captured. So the first of the starting point uh, is one that I've uh, raised now on a few occasions. I've spoken of two movements, a movement to end apartheid and a movement to ensure decent work for domestic workers. I've questioned whether we should be thinking about them as disjointed or rather whether there's a deep continuity. And this um, reflection requires uh, something that um, we've been loath to do globally, and that is to refuse to exceptionalize apartheid in Southern Africa, uh, and rather uh, to think more broadly about the relationship between forms of racial capitalism around the world and how they sustain particular kinds of relationships uh, in work, in work. Decent work for domestic workers became an opportunity to rethink that exceptionalizing by insisting on the global character of that history and its rootedness in forms of subordination that persist or that have powerful afterlives. There's an uncanny commonality across space and time in the kind of subordination and servitude that domestic workers experience. And I believe Myrtle understood that profoundly. And so when one says we need to include in the narrative of labor law a 
broader understanding of our starting points and of our protests, of our understanding of how workers have resisted the structural conditions that prevent them from living lives uh, of social justice in the world of work, uh, that those are as much a part of the history and the foundations of labor law as the Industrial Revolution defined in very place-specific fashions and then um, um, search for almost in the work that takes place um, around the world. So seeing domestic workers' militancy uh, in that continuity helps us to better understand labor laws, trajectories, plural. The second rethinking or boundary redefinition in the narrative is, of course, challenging the productive labor and the so-called uh, reproductive labor dimension uh, in the field. And certainly, uh, Myrtle's ability to insist on domestic work as market enabling, right? That domestic workers take care of the families of those who leave the household to earn their living, right? Is part of the paradigm shift. It is not simply non productive, reproductive work that somehow exists outside of a commodification paradigm um, and uh, is um, performed, of course, for reasons <laughs> beyond um, remuneration um, and for love. Uh, as if domestic workers are like one of the family. And uh, the perfect poem read by Farus at the outset um, uh, captures the form of invisibilization that happens um, in relation to this. And so Myrtle's uh, uh, insistence on claiming that space, uh, and she did it over and over again in so many contexts uh, around the world uh, just shook up a narrative, made it really difficult to sustain. And uh, in linking this to uh, forms of subordination, it's not that we only see the market enabling character in contexts of free labor or fully formed market economies. Um, and there again, the, the, the ability to connect uh, the reproductive labor performed under conditions of deep unfreedom, be it uh, in slave societies, uh, that revolved around a household economy, but that the reproductive labor freed members, males of the uh, slaveholding class to go out and build capital. That is part of the history. And of course, in the contemporary context, the deeply subsidized character of domestic work uh, particularly in global migration for care, um, care chains, as some refer to it, care extraction, um, as uh, Rafael Perenas uh, frames it, um, are part of the uh, 
uh, I would say, sadly, a not dissimilar uh, trajectory. Uh, so uh, we need to think carefully about the depth of the relationship for our own regulatory efforts uh, in labor law. Uh, and that, of course, entails then looking at the actual value, taking a cold, hard look at the actual value of the care work uh, in the contexts. Um, in addition to, and this is the work like no other, uh, the deeply uh, uh, life-sustaining character of the work when we think about its value. So this is uh, um, a profound contribution uh, to how we understand the field of labor law. And the third, which was also alluded to in the introduction, is how uh, addressing um, labor law requires boundary redefining work, right? So a challenge to labor law as really ever having been purely local, but rethinking the distributive character and rethinking the organizing character and at the brilliance with which um, the domestic workers movement, I mean, just imagine it, those workers who are living <laughs> and working in individual households, isolated from most other workers, uh, on their own, as local as one possibly could be, uh, manage to organize nationally, regionally, and transnationally to bring change at the international level. And they have, with support of allies, built an international federation. It is uh, nothing short of remarkable uh, to see the significance of a movement of this power and vibrancy uh, and uh, to uh, just engage with the depth of the importance of this. And Myrtle incarnated this deep understanding of the international, of the transnational. Myrtle went from organizing South African domestic workers from, uh, as I have read from Jennifer Fish's work, and I'm so anxiously looking forward to the biography, from her employer's garage to organizing domestic workers worldwide. And in that process, she never lost touch with her base. Her transnationalism was a rooted transnationalism, rooted in struggle, impregnated with the optimism that comes from recognizing the power of collective worker organizing. And I want to stress this, it's probably unnecessary uh, for the folks who are gathered around this table um, uh, to give tribute to, to Myrtle, but there was nothing naive about it. Myrtle had been imprisoned under apartheid. She understood better than most what it meant to truly struggle. And she also understood why it was crucial to situate the movement in a global frame. She understood the bonds required and she built them uh, with domestic worker leaders around the world with such grace, and it's a testament to that transnational vision. I was particularly moved reading the tributes that um, her sister in Jamaica, Shirley Price, uh, offered to the woman who always kept other women domestic worker leaders from around the world 
by her side. And so when we think about calls for international solidarity as embodying the indivisibility and the interdependence of human rights, we should be thinking of Merville's example. So that spirit of struggle meant that Myrtle never stood still and basked in her laurels. After 2011, she might have said, great, we've got Convention 189, my work is done. Uh, but uh, you have all seen this image, uh, uh, which uh, domestic workers uh, immediately, uh, uh, this banner, domestic workers immediately lowered on the main conference floor after Convention 189 had been adopted. And to, it's just perfect. Congratulations, now ratify implement. Uh, uh, work is not done in many ways. Uh, it was understood. The work is just beginning and the movement was galvanized to continue to fight. Not um, a, just a set of powerful words, but an instrument to ensure meaningful action. And again, this is rooted in a deep connection to the struggle, uh, a deep understanding that domestic workers uh, were suffering continuously, tremendously for some of the worst abuses uh, imaginable um, in their working lives. Uh, there was no time uh, to uh, become complacent. Uh, the movement kept fighting. I recall meeting uh, with uh, Myrtle, each time I visited Cape Town, she always made time to sit, have a meal, discuss at length. Um, she was deeply concerned in particular about migrant domestic workers' rights in South Africa uh, and uh, was at the forefront of calls for recognition of domestic workers' social security rights through the courts, something that we'll hear more about in the comments. And she pointed out how low the statutory minimum wage was and calls for politicians themselves to ensure that living wages were paid. Um, there was an important message in her work that some would treat as a paradox. And I, uh, uh, I, 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 I don't want to walk past this dimension of the message that she conveyed to me in our exchanges. And also um, in the, at uh, the UN in a side event, the Permanent Forum, as Convention uh, 189 was still being negotiated. And you all know of the pride uh, that she affirmed in domestic work as work um, and uh, the need to ensure that the work is understood in that manner. But she also affirmed that domestic workers do not dream that their own daughters will become domestic workers. On the contrary, they want different, better options for their own daughters. And that mirrored my own mother's experience and dreams for her daughters. I've tried to work through that apparent paradox in my own work. And of course, it lands squarely on the permission we give to invisibilize domestic work, its skills, its status, the overrepresentation of historically marginalized workers in these positions is central to the problem. As W.B. Du Bois put it at the beginning of the last century, Domestic work is that it, it combines a despised race in a despised calling. Ultimately, Myrtle's words were a reminder that what we mean by labor law in action could not be more fundamental. That labor law's transformative potential must be at the center of how we understand our field. In other words, we cannot imagine that when a profession is overrepresented 
by members of our societies who are and have been historically marginalized, Black, Indigenous, racialized people around the world. We cannot imagine that the work will simply become valued because we pay it better. But we can imagine, and this is the collective dimension, we can imagine that those workers, like Myrtle, deeply understand the value of their work and seek through their collective action to have the work recognized and deeply respected as well. And as they exercise their freedom of association with a view to fostering substantive equality, they help to build the conditions to change the work. They help to build equality, to build emancipation into the framework. That changes the work, but it doesn't do it alone. It puts the responsibility to think differently and to act differently and to regulate differently squarely in front of all of us. It is partly an ask, partly a demand, and it seeks concessions from power. For care work, that means a call for all of us to take up responsibility to, to radically rethink care work and its relationship to the work uh, that we otherwise may do in the labor market. It means respecting and treating it with dignity, in part because we understand it to be the responsibility we all share uh, for ourselves, for each other. And increasingly, uh, it is understood for our environment. And here's the thing. If we transform our understanding of care work, we all become embodied in that work. And in that sense, we expand the life opportunities too, so that we no longer have to worry that it will only be some of our daughters who do this work, because we all do it. We all value it. The last time I saw Myrtle in person was in 2019 at a few of the events commemorating the ILO centenary, including a conference at Georgetown University in November, where this picture was taken, and of course, the International Labour Conference in June. Myrtle was, of course, at the forefront of leading the ILO to adopt the only convention that has followed Convention 189, the Violence and Harassment Convention Number 190 the power and conviction that domestic workers brought to that initiative can hardly be overstated. Myrtle understood how interconnected the struggle was and why an instrument on violence and harassment at work was crucial to redressing abuse faced by domestic workers. But participation was more than that. It was about claiming and embodying domestic workers' rightful place at the center of labor law. and the center of labor law transnationally for really what standards do not concern domestic workers. Even maritime labor standards, given their breadth and their inclusion of hospitality workers on cruises affects domestic workers. Domestic workers presence is part of shifting the frame. Myrtle had accepted 
our invitation to come to Montreal to celebrate International Workers, Domestic Workers Day on June 16, 2020. We knew she would have galvanized the movement to ratify Convention 189. And I see my uh, comrade Marie Clark Walker there. Um, we would have uh, so loved to welcome her, but the pandemic uh, would decide otherwise, and then life had other plans. Myrtle has fought the good fight. It is, of course, for us to continue to promote the work that she so embodied. That includes coming to a deepened understanding of the very foundations of labor law in emancipation and in insisting upon the kind of boundary crossing that Myrtle understood so clearly and communicated so powerfully to domestic workers and allies around the world. I close this tribute then with Myrtle's words, words that she addressed to the International Labour Conference in 2010, after the first year of committee meetings, when Convention 189 really started to feel possible. We have managed to bring domestic workers to the ILO, and I'm sure you will feel the spirit and see the hope and expression on our faces. We wanted to show you the importance of domestic workers who contribute to building the economies of the world by looking after your families and your homes. We are sure that for the first time, the delegates at this conference could feel, hear, and experience the unity among the domestic workers and maybe we will convince you that united we can move mountains. Thank you, Adal, for a fitting tribute which goes to the depth and breadth of Myrtle's impact on not only domestic work as decent work, but it extends way beyond that into the realm of social justice. And yes, she fought a good fight and we, pledge here to continue. So I'm not going to attempt to summarize um, your exceptional input here. I will ask Kelly Bohili now to take us into the realm of the local. And then I will open for just a few questions. Um, in question time and this is not the end of the conversation i think you've raised so many really pertinent issues you know just the word rethinking i think for me kind of you know goes swirls around my head in terms of so many um, aspects of the work we do the engagement um, and we can't do justice in a few minutes. So I'd like to see this as the start or rather a continuation of a conversation that is long overdue. So without further ado, I will call on Kelly Bukhile um, and then we will open up for questions and comments. Once again, thanks, Adele. Thank you so much, Feruz. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Center for Transformative Regulation of Work for inviting me to participate in this webinar um, and to Professor Blackett for such a moving reflection on Mayor Myrtle's life and her contribution to advocacy for domestic workers' rights in the international and domestic spheres. Um, I'm very honored to be included in this webinar. I'm, I'm having one of those very weird experiences where 
you're recognizing names in the in the Zoom meeting room um, from the many journal articles that I've been going through over the years um, on domestic work as well as other worker rights. Um, so I just really wanted to thank um, a lot of you who are in, in, in this webinar for your contribution to helping, you know, as young researchers who were trying to learn about the space in, yeah, in, in shaping our understanding about what is a very unique sector. Um, and just also before I start, I just wanted to, to mention how very touched I was by the poem you read, Feirouz, at the beginning. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one, um, but you know, I've been really reflecting on life recently as everyone has been post the COVID pandemic. Um, and yeah, really thinking about how, you know, my, my mother was actually one of those women or one of those children rather who were left behind in the homelands um, as her mother came to Johannesburg um, as a domestic worker, you know, taking care of other people's children um, while her own children were left behind. Um, and I've seen, you know, the, the real, the very real cost um, of, what has happened to millions and millions of children in South Africa and continues to happen today. So I'll be talking about um, you know, this, this topic about giving, trying to give effect to labor rights of domestic workers in South Africa through the lens of our experience at the Socioeconomic Rights Institute um, with the Mathangu versus the Minister of Labor case which resulted in the landmark constitutional court judgment declaring the constitutional invalidity of section one, subsection 19, paragraph five of the Compensation of Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act, which we commonly refer to as COIDA, which previously excluded domestic workers who are employed in, in private households from the definition of employee, which precluded them from claiming from the compensation fund for work-related injuries diseases and death. Um, it was through this case that I met May Myrtle and began regularly engaging with her as well as some of her, her colleagues at Satsau. Um, and as I think many people know, this the Mahlangu case was actually brought um, to Seri by, by Satsau um, and the union served as the second applicant to the case. And as such, really from the beginning, um, the 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 role of of Myrtle and her colleagues, um, and the domestic worker um, organize other domestic worker organizations as well, um, really can't be overstated. Um, their effort has been central to the success of the litigation. Um, it was really a collective effort. So, in addition to Satsau, which is the South African Domestic Service and Allied Workers Union. Um, there was also the United Domestic Workers of South Africa, a, a relatively new union that has been formed, is, which is based mostly in Pretoria, um, as well as Izwi Domestic Workers Alliance, which is a network of domestic workers based in Johannesburg, um, which has a focus on migrant domestic workers, which brings um, you know, this very important issue of citizenship, citizenship and um, the rights of migrant domestic workers into the conversation. So what I hope to do today is just to reflect on the process of litigation, as well as the advocacy that really formed the foundation for um, the success of the litigation, um, but also to, to reflect on the very difficult process of implementing um, what is a very, um, yeah, which is a landmark case, um, but really implementing something in a sector that is unique, like domestic work. So the current reality of domestic workers in South Africa, I think we, we have all have an understanding that um, the reality of domestic workers in South Africa now, even though South Africa has the more, one of the more progressive legal frameworks for domestic workers globally, um, is, is quite reflective of the situation of domestic workers in, during apartheid. Um, but it sh what should be um, what we can be proud of as South Africa is the fact that our labor laws or our labor framework that regulates domestic workers is very much aligned with the international labor standards. And um, we know that South Africa has ratified Convention 189, 
and we've heard really about the the strength of the the movement, the domestic workers movement in South Africa in contributing to international spaces, as well as shaping the reality for domestic workers in terms of their inclusion in various laws um, in the domestic um, arena as well. So in general, domestic workers are included in um, labor laws that other workers are included in. So uh, Labor Relations Act, Basic Conditions of Employment Act, um, you know, we have sectoral determination seven, which really provides a closer regulation of this quite this, this vulnerable sector. Um, but really through the advocacy of Satsau, Mamberto, um, and other allied organizations, we saw the inclusion of domestic workers in the Unemployment Insurance Act in the early 2000s, um, and most recently the National Minimum Wage Act, as well as the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act. Um, so what we would ideally, we, what we want to be seeing is, is um, on the ground, these laws being um, refelt um, and the experiences of domestic workers uh, reflecting the experiences of other workers. So things like, you know, decent working hours, overtime pay, um, being respected, public holidays, paid leave, fair dismissal procedures. Um, and something even basic as having written particulars of employment. We, we, were, we, we were hoping, I think, um, at the beginning of the democratic era and through the efforts of the domestic workers unions in fighting for domestic worker rights and their inclusion in labor laws during apartheid, um, that this would be something that would be felt on the ground. Um, and the reality is that we know that despite all of this effort, um, and the inclusion in, in labor laws in black and white. Um, domestic workers remain one of the most exploited occupational groups today. Um, domestic worker unions and, and organizations really describe um, a situation where uh, the working conditions of domestic workers for the most part are poor um, with the threat of dismissal being quite high on the list of um, um, of, of conditions that affect domestic workers quite greatly. Um, we know that um, it's very difficult to actually get information about the domestic work sector, how you know, each and each one of these labor standards as outlined in sectoral determination seven is, is, um, is, is, is compli complied with by employers. Um, however, we know we have a few statistics here and there that um, can share with that that show us just how um, the problem of non-compliance uh, is, is pervasive in South Africa. Um, it was reported by WeGo that about 20%, only 20% of domestic workers were registered for UIF. I know that there's other numbers floating around on the internet, um, but I think when we, we speak with, with domestic workers and their representatives in the unions and other organizations, we see that you know, compliance with something like UIF, uh, the Unemployment Insurance Fund, and contributions by employers is indicative of really how um, employers are actually complying with the other laws that cover domestic workers, which is quite poor. Um, the other challenge, I think, of course, is that um, uni unionization in South Africa amongst domestic workers is low. So according to um, Statistics South Africa, only about 0.5% percent of domestic workers are unionized, and this is a statistic from 2017. Um, and so while our labor laws are progressive and in line with international labor standards, um, in practice, domestic workers do not um, enjoy these rights. Um, and this is mainly because of non-compliance of employees of domestic workers. Um, and weak enforcement mechanisms um, by the Department of Employment and Labor and its agencies. Um, that being said, it, it, we do need to acknowledge that enforcing laws that cover domestic workers is not something that's, that's easy. Um, regulating work in, in, in the domestic work sphere, which takes place in private households, is not something that's simple um, because we, it, it carries with it the intersecting racial, class, gender inequalities experienced by domestic workers during apartheid. These, these, 
these things still persist. Um, and another layer that um, ISRI domestic workers is highlighting for us is the 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 complexity or the yeah the complexity that citizenship um, or my the experiences of migrant domestic workers is is bringing into the conversation as well. So this is just a brief overview, uh, and I'm sure there's more that can be said about what the situation of domestic workers is right now in South Africa. But I just wanted to to jump to the. Um, Matlangu case, um, give a little bit of background and just um, reflect a little bit on how, what our experience has been at the Socioeconomic Rights Institute in the, 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 the period post the judgment of the Constitutional Court. Um, so the Matlangu case was brought about by very unfortunate, tragic um, circumstances where Ms. Maria Matlangu, who was a domestic worker in Pretoria, um, drowned in the home of her employer um, on the morning of March, uh, 31st of March, 2012. Um, she was the sole breadwinner for her family. And when her family sought compensation for her death, they were told that um, domestic workers were not covered by workmen's compensation um, as COIDA specifically excludes them from the ambit of its protection. Um, and it was really through this process of Maria Matlangu's daughter, Sylvia, trying to um, find justice or recourse for what had happened to her family that she partnered up with an organizer from Satsau who um, goes by the name of um, Bingi Mashiani, who really walked this journey with the, the Matlangu family. So, it was at the stage that Satsau decided really to pursue litigation as a strategy to realize um, the rights of domestic workers and in particular, um, the inclusion of domestic workers in workmen's compensation. So um, with the help of, of Satsau um, and uh, in particular Pinky Mashian, who was then an organizer of Satsau, they, the Matlangu family challenged the, the exclusion of domestic workers through the courts from 2018. Um, and this culminated in a constitutional court judgment that was handed down on 19th November, 2020. So in this, in this order, section um, one of the Compensation of Occupational and um, Injuries and Diseases Act, um, subsection 19, paragraph five in particular, was declared constitutionally invalid. Um, what was also really significant about um, the process of this litigation was that the order of constitutional validity was to have immediate and retrospective effect from 27 April um, 1994, which basically means that domestic workers and dependents with claims from back from then, from, from 1994, April 1994, are also able to submit claims. Um, so while it is acknowledged that the Department of Labor had plans to, um, to amend um, COIDA, they were in constant conversation with, with the unions about why it is important, how, how, uh, why it is important to, to include domestic workers in COIDA. They had indicated that they had plans to, in, to, to include domestic workers in COIDA. What is really significant about the Matlangu case is this retrospective application of the declaration of constitutional invalid invalidity. Um, it gives um, the opportunity for potentially thousands and thousands of families to achieve justice for their family members who have who had died or domestic workers who have are living with um, injuries or diseases that were contracted um, during the course of their work, you know, as far back as 1994. What the case also did was to highlight that there are certain misconceptions, many misconceptions about domestic work. And one of them is that because it's in a private household, um, that it, the private household is a safe environment and that um, people who are employed in such environments do not need protection for, for um, work-related injuries and diseases. There was a study that was done by Solidarity Center where um, domestic workers were interviewed and it revealed that, you know, there's so many different injuries that domestic workers can and do contract or 
um, experience in the workplace, such as dog bites. I think a lot of us have read in, in recent um, years about the, the many cases of domestic workers actually being attacked by their owner's dogs. Um, back injuries are quite common, broken limbs, um, bone fractures. Um, it, it, the, 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 there's a very clear um, need for protection, even though it is in, um, in, a, in the private sphere. Um, so after the, the Matlangu victory, I think we, we as an organization were cognizant of the fact that just changing the law and including domestic workers in FOIDA is not going to be enough. Uh, we were aware of the challenges that lay ahead. Um, and I just wanted to touch on some of the, the, the challenges that we've been experiencing as an organization in the two and a half years post Matlangu. Um, I also just wanted to mention that I think um, the strategy, and this has been really informed by the unions um, that Seri took um, in its advocacy around Matlangu, was to basically use the case as a point around which issues in the in the sector are brought to um, policy and implementation discussions, um, as well as at the forefront of the public discourse. Um, so just in the two and a half years since the Matlangu victory, um, we, we, we were able to really um, form a collective, a group which was really led by the domestic worker unions, um, where we, we have opened up a space to consult with the compensation fund about implementing the, the judgment. Um, the statistics currently about how many, essentially how many domestic workers have actually put through or put in or submitted their, their claims to the compensation fund and how many employers um, have actually registered their domestic workers um, with the fund are quite poor. So last year in June, when we um, inquired um, and got this information from the compensation fund, um, and this was after almost two years um, since the, the inclusion of domestic workers through the judgment, there were only seven claims that had been processed by the compensation fund and um, 1,600 registrations by employers. Um, when we met with the compensation fund earlier this year, the number had gone up to 14 claims. Um, and so it really, uh, yeah, it, 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 we, it was a very sober realization that this is going to be an uphill battle. Um, and we began to really think about what are the reasons for the lack of uptake, uh, for lack of a better phrase, um, from both domestic workers and employers of domestic workers. Um, one of the, the, the biggest, I think, um, issues is just the, the, the process of um, socializing or publicizing the inclusion of domestic workers in COIDA has been quite limited. Um, from our perspective at SERI, we've, you know, it's our reach um, in the media is quite limited. Um, and the few cases that we've actually gotten have been through, um, yeah, from, through word of mouth, through the media engagements that we, that we do, talking about the case and inviting people with claims to, to um, approach us should they need assistance with um, put, uh, processing their claims and understanding what this law means for them. Um, however, there are other challenges as well. Um, so in addition to domestic workers, as well as employers, the general public not really having knowledge about this, despite the fact that, you know, it has been gazetted that there was a call for employees of domestic workers to um, register employees. Um, the other issues that, that also domestic workers are experiencing is um, at the level of um, administration. So in the labor centers, when a domestic worker approaches um, an official to, to put in there to submit their claims. There's a lot of misinformation um, and they're turned back um, when, for example, they don't have the information of their employers and things like that. Um, so this has really become an obstacle. Um, there are many domestic workers who actually approach um, labor centers with claims, but they're just simply turned back. And we know that it is not practical or fair to expect domestic workers to keep 
um, you know, going back and forth, visiting labor centers to, to put in their claims. Eventually they, they do give up just because of, you know, resource constraints and things like that. Um, yeah. So it's also not very clear how retrospective claims will be processed. Um, this information hasn't become um, available, has been made available by the compensation fund. Um, so there are current claims. So in the, you know, between the time of the, the, the judgment, so in 2000, 2022 from November, um, there have been people who have been experiencing injuries and then approaching organizations like SERI or the unions for assistance. We know that there are potentially thousands of claims um, that need to be applied retrospectively. But this information is not necessarily made public. Um, we, we, as an organization that it has, you know, resources that has been litigating, we ourselves wouldn't know how to assist someone with a, with a retrospective, um, with a retrospective claim outside of a situation like Ms. Matlangu's that um, underwent litigation. So, I mean, some of the lessons I think um, that we've learned so far include the importance of advocacy. So before the judgment and after, after the judgment, advocacy has really been the, the bedrock of moving things along. Um, the mobilization of domestic workers around the case and the, their presence in the court hearings was um, monumental. Um, but accompanying that has been some serious media advocacy um, on, um, on the inclusion of domestic workers in, in COIDA. Um, which has been really limited because we, as an organization, the unions, we yeah, we don't have the reach that a government agency, for example, would have. Um, but we've, we've been trying to, in addition to media advocacy, do community advocacy. So workshops, uh, the creation of information sheets for domestic workers, resource guides and other materials to help um, the process of informing domestic workers of what their rights are, as well as employers as well. Um, but I think the sort of the one avenue that looks like it's really bearing some fruit is the engagement, the direct engagement um, between the unions and the compensation fund. That space has been opened up through the litigation. Um, and the regular engagement of these two bodies, as well as other civil society organizations that have been invited to that space, feels like the most, um, yeah, the, at, at the moment, something that is, is advancing the process of implementation of, um, of COIDA. So I just, I feel I'll, I'll just stop there. Um, I'm sure there might, there, there might be some questions just about the, the case itself, as well as what has been happening post the case. But yeah, thank you very much, Faris. Thank you, um, El Bukhile. Um, we, we're kind of running out of time. Um, and so, yeah, we've kind of moved from global to local. And I'm sure there are questions, comments, um, and I'm going to allow, you know, given the time constraint, um, I'm going to allow three people um so this is your opportunity to engage with the with the topic um yeah i mean quite a lot has come through from the speaker and also from um the respondent and As I said, um, you know, we can't really do justice to um, all the insights gained here. Um, and if there are no questions, I mean, you know, I think everyone can also feel free to engage with us um, uh, after, after this uh, seminar, if there aren't any questions right now. I don't see any hands up. 
Debbie? Yes, sorry, my hand was not up um, because I can't find my my hand button on my <laughs> device and my neither my screen. But um, maybe if I could also just take this opportunity really to thank our speakers. Um, it's really grounding in 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 a way to you know hear of the work that Myrtle did in this way. But also, Faruz, just to to recognize your role. Um, you know, and and the road that you've worked with with Myrtle, and um, and that the work will continue in Centro. Um, and it was really interesting to hear from Kelly Bochile as well on on what has happened since Machlangu, because I think a lot of us haven't you know haven't had that feedback and follow up, um, and the barriers that still exist. Um, you know, I, I, I wondered to what extent. I think Myrtle was somebody who never got discouraged, but um, you know, and and it is about how are, are we going about this the right way? How do we how do we build those advocacy um, lines, and how do we build on the organisation? Um, you know, so are, are we? I guess maybe not so much a comment, but a sort of question from from. Um, Kelly Bochile and, and Adele, you know, are we on the right road? Are we losing the sort of momentum that might have been picked up around Convention 189, even when continuing in 190? Um, or, you know, do, do we feel that, um, yeah, that the work can, can continue and, and the organizing be strengthened? Or, or, or are we a little bit concern that yeah the momentum um is difficult to maintain but yeah um and Faris you may also have a sense you know from your own engagement which is really ongoing and daily with the sector sort of yeah just to you know know that what we should be doing um is really seeing much greater numbers uh, of of you know registrations and inclusion in our broader social security framework, yet it seems like that even if we sort of knock down the sort of legal barriers, the, the kind of the implementation or the follow-up just seems to to lag, and and that lag maybe creates a, a bigger gap always. Um, so maybe I'm hoping somebody leaves me feeling a little bit more <laughs> positive. But yeah, again, thank you to you and and to the speakers. To Adele, it was uh, really, and I'm sorry I, I joined late. Um, thank you. Jennifer, I can see you are ready to go. Well, I echo deep thanks, both of you. I'm, I'm imagining that Myrtle would be so pleased to have her tribute so beautifully shared by Adele, followed up by a call to action in an actual case. That was really so relevant to Myrtle's life. So I'm also thinking about what do we do in her magnanimous absence? And I think many of us on this call today are wondering how to carry that work forward. And she was absolutely the embodiment of accountability because of the deep struggle she held in the anti-apartheid movement and then the role that she held with the international movement. And so I'm, I'm thinking about that today too. And I just wanted to share my gratitude for everyone here. I wanted to note that Myrtle's daughter, Jackie Michels is here. And I hope that Ferruz and Darcy, the forums that you've created through the Social Law Project might be a place where we can hold both Myrtle's memory, philosophies and her actions. So I, I really look forward to our ongoing connections. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Jennifer. We, we certainly will try. And I come back to Adal's points again about the need to address labor law, which requires boundary rethinking. Rethinking, rethinking. We talk about, you know, there's, I think Kelly Bukhile also mentioned that, you know, um, Domestic workers in South Africa are very well covered by the law. And when it comes to implementation, it just falls flat because I do believe that much of the labor law is written um, 
you know, for a different uh, type of worker. And so, you know, the safety net for domestic workers, this safety net, while it exists, it's filled with holes. So it's not much of a defense, sadly. And so I do think, you know, I, I, I really think, um, you know, rethinking boundaries um, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll certainly try to, you know, along with organizations like Seri and yourselves, you know, the people in this room, um, you know, how we can sort of uh, concretize um, the insights that, that were shared here today. So as I said, um, this is not the first, nor will it be the last um, in this important conversation, I think. So, Adele, would you, yeah. May I just uh, th uh, thank you for those uh, comments and they're, they're so poignant, uh, Debbie, Jennifer, and Fadus, uh, your last reflection just, um, it, yeah, <laughs> it leaves me wanting more of the conversations we started uh, because that, that is exactly the point, right? We've thought about inclusion as just, okay, we'll get rid of the exception. We'll even make it retrospective or retroactive. And I very much uh, appreciated uh, the depth of the presentation that you offered, Kele Bohile. Not only, you know, there's a legal victory, but look what's not happening. And part of the standard setting uh, was very much it's not enough to just say, okay, now you're included. We need to be thinking differently. What are the supportive mechanisms that change the framework? And for domestic work, uh, in household, uh, individual families, different kind of framings of the law, very little by way of realistic implementation that often means proactive measures where the very act of payment and we've seen many examples of this around the world folds in a broad range of worker and social security payments you can even have presumptions and in a society with such high levels of domestic work you can literally presume a household has a domestic worker, unless they dislodge the presumption. There are different ways, but they require thinking outside of an industrial frame. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the boundary redefining is crucial. Otherwise, you just won't get the inclusion. So um, on that, um, I love this, uh, Jennifer, embodiment of accountability. Part of that accountability is, is refusing uh, to allow ourselves to feel congratulatory because we've got a piece of paper, right? Uh, there's so much work to be done and it's, it's sometimes uh, on the streets and it's sometimes in the courts and it's sometimes thinking outside of the boundaries that we're given to really um, ensure that gains are real for domestic workers. So, um, yeah, I that the uh, that uh, embodiment of accountability, um, uh, I think, yes. is uh, a source of hope uh, for how we move forward. Thank you, Adele. Debbie, I hope that sort of lifts your thinking somewhat. Thank um, you. Yeah, on that note, um, sorry, I'd like to... Sorry, yes, I think yes. Vanessa Pillay has a hand up. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, Vanessa? Thank you, sorry. My, sorry, my camera is not working. So if I try and turn it on, that's, you, that's what you'll see, a black spot so apologies apologies for that 
And thank you, thank you um, to everyone for the beautiful um, um, tribute. I just wanted to share in this conversation a very inspiring piece of work that the International Domestic Worker Federation is doing. Um, and we've been um, supporting them as part of, from, from WeGo, I'm from WeGo. And um, with IDWF in Africa, we have been doing a program called Making C189 Real. Um, you know, we put out the toolkit on just unpacking the convention for domestic workers and, and what each piece of it entails and, and how they could move forward beyond ratification, even if their countries didn't ratify, but what were the provisions inside the convention that they could still struggle for with, with the limitations that you have reflected and shared. And it was so heartening, I must tell you all that uh, just this last March, we went to the pre-Congress uh, meeting of the region in, in Dar es Salaam. And there, all the affiliates from across Africa, each one had such inspiring outcomes from that process of making C189 real, all the way from individual domestic workers having the courage to even just put the toolkit on the coffee table of their employer and getting the, to the employer to start engaging on what does this mean and what is this book lying around to Zimbabwe who have managed to get an employers of domestic workers association formed so that they could negotiate with employers. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that. And I'm sure Myrtle is smiling down on, on, those, on those outcomes. So, yes, they are working to make C189 real. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ferus. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Vanessa. Um, if there are no other hands, if I'm missing anyone else, um, I think this is the time to close up this discussion. Um, and thank you to the speakers and for those who have contributed to the conversation. And I can't emphasize more point that we will be um, continuing this conversation going forward. So we will be in touch.